All right, so it is six o'clock. Um, I know Don thought he might or might not join us tonight, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, but I'll watch the participant list to see if he's coming in. So it is uh, Monday, May 3rd, 2021. We are at uh, the Moortown Slick Board. We are meeting via Zoom again. Um, and so we'll start off. We have general public comment tonight. Um, we have uh, a few a few guests. Um, and then uh, a fairly early adjournment, depending on how things go. So we're going to start now with um, general public comment. So if there's anyone that's joined us tonight for general public comment, come on off mute and um, share what you'd like to share, please. Uh, this is Craig. May I speak? Go ahead, Craig. Yep, go ahead. Hi, select board. Um, Craig Oshkello. I live on Living Tree Lane, which is a new private road off Freeman Hill Road. Um, been here six years. And we have um, approved, pl approved PUD or plan unit development with seven units from 2015. And while all the lots remain in the same place, it turns out that one driveway is ending up with three, serving three houses. So uh, the zoning administrator, David, came out and visited. I'll let him speak for himself, but I think to determine that we need to create another private road here. So before you tonight should be an application with um, three of our top names. We have a homeowners association, so the HOA got together and did our one of our first big decisions, and we, we came up with a list of our top three choices. Um, I'll leave it there if you have any questions. And if I may, I'd pass the mic over to our new neighbor, Paige Finkelstein, who's uh, a resident here um, at, in our plan unit development. Thank you, Tom. Yep. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Paige, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Paige. Like Craig said, it's really nice to meet everyone. Um, my husband and I are going to be one of uh, – the units off of this drive that we're hoping you'll approve our, our name choice to become a private um, road. So I'm just here to observe and um, uh, show support. And it's really uh, nice to, to see everyone. All right, well, thank you and uh, welcome to town. I, um, nice. <laughs> a really uh, nice area up there. Mm. All right, um, any other general public comment before we move on? All right, I see no one with their hand up or screaming in the background. We'll go ahead and move on the agenda. So we have Cheryl Lynn. She's here to uh, talk about uh, the validation and general resolution related to Article 7, which was the uh, sidewalk loan. So Cheryl Lynn, if you want to come off mute, please, and do share. She just texted me, and she's having um, – she can't hear the meeting. Okay. Technically, technical, technical difficulties. All right. So, um, <laughs> well, we're, while she's trying to go ahead with that, why don't we go ahead and let her fiddle with, um, she can come in and out and I can let her back in. Okay. Um, I see that Tori is here from the, um, the school board. So why don't we just go ahead and we'll take 15 minutes, um, 15 or 20 minutes with Tori, and then we'll pick up with Cheryl if she's available at that point. That's all right. It that sounds like great. she's calling in. So our next guest tonight is uh, Tori Smith. Uh, welcome, Tori. Tori is the select board, the, 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 board chair, the school board chair for the Harwood Union Unified District. And um, based on what we heard last week or their last call, uh, last select board meeting, um, there were some questions on uh, the school board voting, uh, re-voting again with the uh, the merger with the, uh, I guess, the, the seventh and eighth grades. Um, so Tori has um, jumped on to just kind of give us an update, kind of what's going on. You know, we hear lots of things, read some things, but this way it's coming right from uh, someone who knows and uh, then if we have a few questions, uh, the board is welcome to uh, go ahead and ask. But again, welcome, Tori. Thank you very much. So if you can just 
and let us know what what's coming up and maybe some reasons behind that and we can go from there. Sure, thanks. Thanks for having me tonight. It's nice to see you all. And um, I'm also joining us is Tim Jones, who's the vice chair with me. And we've been working together for a couple months now. And I'm just really excited about our collaborative efforts. Tim lives in Faiston, and he's been on the board for, uh, I think this is the third year. Um, so could you, thanks, Tim. could you pepper me with a couple more questions so I have a little bit better sense of sure. well, what I can right. tell you? So, yeah. So I don't want to waste understand. your time. Yeah, no, that's no problem. So we understand that you guys, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, are as a board going to be voting again to merge the Crossed Brook students with uh, the middle school students up at the Harwood uh, High School. Um, and the timeline there, and just really the reasonings by that, and just really what what is the plan going? Uh, forward with mergers or not and, and students changing just so that we can understand so we're better equipped to you know support or, or, or not quite frankly. Okay I will try to answer and um, ask additional questions if I haven't covered enough bases and Tim feel free to jump in and um, contribute as well. Um, so back in I think it was December, um, the board voted to merge the seventh and eighth grades at Crossbrook in the fall of um, 2022. So a year from now, or a little over a year from now, almost almost two years from the time it voted. Um, and we have been um, frankly not doing much about it since then, partly because it's sort of, there wasn't much of a rush and we needed to sort of figure out um, the next step we thought was to figure out what we would need to do as a district to be prepared for that. And in this case, the first big thing would be to make some facilities decisions. Would Crossit Brook need an addition or not in order to have enough space for the students to thrive there? So that's actually where the board work has been focused. Um, and in January, the board put together sort of a list of requests of information. Um, and then basically in March, a report came out uh, answering those questions. Okay, it would cost this much to do a two room addition, this much to do a four room, this much to do a six. You could do it using annexes, which are like temporary buildings, or you could do it using a permanent addition. Um, and these are the impacts on students. You know, this would mean that, you know, there'd be plenty of room for everybody. This would mean that there'd be plenty of room for regular classrooms, but maybe we would need um, a music teacher to float around the school, that kind of thing. So that was sort of, that's the information we've been looking at. Um, and the goal is to make a decision about that facilities um, decision in the end of May. Um, and then after that, the, the principals and staff will know what size space they're working with, when it will happen, and they can start planning around that. And that's when the real detail work starts happening. Um, and that won't be carried out by the board, that would be carried out by the people in the schools and, and communicating with parents and families as well to make sure that their concerns and questions were being answered and met. Uh, after the new board um, was elected in um, a town meeting day, uh, in the first meeting, a motion was made to reconsider the merger of the seventh and eighth grade at Crossit Brook. Um, and so that has gone on the table, uh, well, not gone on the table, it is on the agenda for the same day as this other facilities vote. Um, so my prediction is that we will start that meeting with a vote about to merge or not to merge. And then if we vote to continue the merger, then we will take up the facilities question and continue moving forward. Uh, in terms of why that was brought up, um, I don't know the exact reasoning behind um, the motion. I think actually Lisa may have been the person who made the motion, so she may have been able to fill that in for you. I do. Um, I know that these decisions in our group have often been um, not enormous majorities. They're often 50-40 or 60-40. Um, and we did have se several new members to the board. Um, and it seems like maybe they had a um, different position than previous board members. So it is a possibility to overturn the past work of the board. Um, so we'll see what happens um, at the end of May. Does that answer your question? One, one um, thought I had was I have occasionally seen in the newspaper references to 
um, changes at Moortown that are on the on the docket for the board and for the community. And I um, I just wanted to say that that is not something that's on the docket at this time. Um, about two years ago, the board did develop a long term plan, but the plan was really like, this is the direction we think we're going to go, but we're going to need to finalize each of these decisions. And so as you probably know, that plan had sort of three components. The one was merging the seven and eight across it. One was moving the fifth and sixth graders at Moortown over to cross it. And one was the possibility of closing phased in. But none of those are final decisions. And at this time, there is no discussion or agenda planning around moving the Moortown fifth and sixth graders over. So um, nothing's happening behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, anywhere about that at this time. OK, you must have questions. Or Tim, yeah, maybe you have additions. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Tim, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, no, I think that really encapsulates uh, what we've been doing, just to accentuate that we've had facilities uh, committees on both the high school and the middle school as well. So I think the, the work that we have been doing as representative uh, of the board, even though there's been turnover here in March, this really started early uh, last summer. Uh, we started the year speaking about this, obviously put it on the back burner some uh, for all things COVID related, but uh, certainly at the end of the year uh, picked up steam. So I think it's a, been a broad group of, of uh, board members working on this uh, up to and including uh, folks that have, have joined the board recently. So again, I think it's it's really focused on, on facilities and I think Tari uh, made a good point of, you know, the longer term planning uh, aspects of this. Certainly I think the seven, eight decision has been, uh, been on the table since before I joined. So. Um, again, the longer term uh, elements of Moortown and Faston uh, certainly are, are conversations that, that need to be had um, into the future, but I think uh, everybody's focused on, on this component of it right now. Thanks, uh, and, and Tori, thanks for that update. Uh, and certainly it's nice to, to hear that uh, certainly in the near future that Moortown is, there's no uh, uh, plans to, to shuttle these students. Um, but with that decision to to move the seventh and eighth, so you're looking at what the facility changes would, would be, and you'll you'll learn that later this month. Um, what what is the ultimate goal, though? Why do you feel that you need to merge those students? I guess is the question. Is there any you know what's the big impetus behind that? Um, you know. Each board member will have different reasons if they're choosing to support either side. Um, this process really started a couple years ago after a difficult budget season where we were looking at um, a number of factors that are really driving the property taxes up pretty rapidly. Um, so a lot of the property taxes, I'm not sure if it's as complicated for town budgets as it is for the school budget. but you know, we put together a certain, we have control over a certain set of numbers, but then the state actually controls a huge number of the sort of multipliers and dividers that are going to create our tax rate. Um, so if we look at what's happening in our district and how that's playing out in the tax rate because of the state formula, things like declining enrollment, which have been a, sort of happening across our district, not in each town, but have as a whole across our district been happening consistently for you know, 10 or 15 years now. And it is actually happening through almost all of Vermont, almost all of New England, um, even all of the Northeast. Like this is, a, this is, not, um, this is not a problem of our district uh, explicitly, but it is a problem in our district. Um, declining enrollment basically drives our per student costs up. And the per student cost is one of the major factors in the tax rate. So that's the declining enrollment also sort of, it, um, it's tricky because you don't just lose like 30 kids in one school and now you can drop a class. What happens typically is, you know, you lose two or three kids in each school, which at the um, elementary school level isn't necessarily such a big deal. But when you lose two or three kids from each school and we have, you know, five feeding elementary schools, that's going to be 10 to 15 kids in each graduating class in high school. And so suddenly that's like, that's a, that's a substantive number of kids, right? Um, so anyways, 
it feels to me like one of the things that's happened is these little drops that are coming out of the school, the elementary school populations are then hitting the high school in a pretty detrimental way, which then has historically before we were um, united, it was more obvious because the high school budget would have to make these huge cuts every year, but the locals, the, the elementary schools wouldn't have to because they've just had these little, these little drips, but Harwood would have these these um, droplets, I don't know, or they'd, they'd lose a quarter cup instead of a drop. Um, so we were seeing in declining enrollment and we were seeing also um, when the, the district merged, um, we received a pretty great tax benefit uh, for five years. So the first year we were gonna get 10 cents off our property tax, the next year was eight cents, next year six cents. So we were really insulated even for the last four or five years um, from our rising taxes by this tax incentive that we had. Well, this coming year will be the last year that we have it. So one of the things the board could see is that even though we haven't had to raise taxes very much in the last couple of years, we're almost done with that tax incentive. And now we're going to have to actually cover our community every bit of the tax rate increase. And so we were looking at almost like a little kind of cliff that we were going to fall off of. Um, and that year that the year the tax or the um, the the budget year before we came up with the, the motion that really started all this, we had looked at cutting, I think it was just $300,000 from, you know, it was probably a $38 million budget then, which doesn't seem like very much, but suddenly we're looking at maybe either cutting foreign language in the elementary schools or cutting all the behavioral, uh, we had just hired a bunch of um, basically specialists who could try to uh, work with kids before they needed, like, kids who were on the cusp, maybe not quite special ed, but they weren't thriving. So could we bring in a specialist who could try to work with those kids individually, help support them, get a little extra growth that year and allow them to stay thriving um, instead of having, I mean, we hope that all children thrive in our special education, but if we could just kind of keep them thriving and mainstream that, that felt like an even better solution. And just to make sure every kid was getting what they needed. So we were looking at having to cut that suddenly. So you know, a three hundred thousand um, dollar cut, for example, that's four teachers. So we we kept seeing that every year. We kept trying to plug these little holes, plug these little holes, and and it was like we were just eroding programs slowly. And that is that's a terrible feeling for schools. It's a terrible feeling for districts. So we try. We said basically, we need to take a more holistic look at um, at what's going on how we're spending money, where it's going, what resources are being, how they're, how they're being allocated. Uh, and the other, of course, a huge thing that's been on people's minds for almost a decade now is the need for a bond at Harwood. So Harwood is a 50 or 60 year old building. And um, although it has been actually incredibly maintained by our district and our, um, our facilities folks, it's still you know, a, a pretty old building. It has original HVAC, it has um, original PAs, like you can't get an announcement to go through the whole building at once, which is, that's not a safe, optimal environment in this in this moment. Um, we have leaky roofs, we have, oh, sorry, I'm getting some kind of feedback. Um, we have oh, asbestos in the, the lab uh, tables and the flooring. We, we have, about $20 million in essential repairs that have to happen. These are not luxury repairs. So one of the things that we also knew was coming down the pipe, we've got, so we've got declining student enrollment. We've got, um, uh, we've got this tax uh, incentive that we're going to lose. And we have, we know we need to get a bond to, to fix the high school, which is going to be another increase in taxes. So the board just realized we have to take a look and kind of put everything on the table. And let's see if we can find some ways to um, kind of use our resources a little more efficiently and still deliver the great education that we believe in and we count on. So that started this whole like analysis and we, we set up lists of questions we needed to know, not just enrollment, but um, building costs, uh, class distribution, class sizes. And, and we kind of looked at all these pieces of the puzzle and that's where we kind of came up with the plan. So. Um, it is funny that money is often the thing that starts a conversation, but at every step of the way, the conversation has always been about money and outcomes, not just money. And when we look at this middle school merger, um, actually money has 
barely been on the table in our recent conversations. It's been a lot about, well, is the prog what's the programming going to be like when we do it? Is it going to be just as good? Is it going to be better? We've seen some inequities between the two middle schools. Um, Harwood and CrossFit do not offer the same opportunities for their students. They're not necessarily better, one better than the other, but they're not the same. We've seen a pretty significant exodus from Harwood Middle School over to CrossFit Brook Middle School, which has been kind of pushing cross it at the seams at the same time that it's like asphyxiating Harwood a little. So, you know, all these things have led the board to, toward this path and down this path. I know that's a long winded answer, but it's, it's like such a complicated ecosystem that people are trying to navigate and plan around. No, I think that was a really good, good answer. And I think something um, everyone needs to hear. I think we, like I said, we hear, we hear drips of it and drabs of, you know, what these plans and mergers are and, and what the value is to our communities. Um, so certainly having you here to, to explain a little bit of that and some of the motivations behind it. Um, let me ask uh, some of the other board members. We have uh, four other board, three other board members here tonight. Um, John, Ray, or Callie, do you have any questions? Uh, Tori or Tim, um, we have a few more minutes before um, we need to run with them. I have a question. Um, and th thank you, well, Tori and Tim, for showing up tonight. Uh, mine is more of a logistics question, I think. Uh, it sounds like you're going to vote next month uh, on the merger again, and then the facilities. It just seems like to me that you would want to know the cost of the facility improvement before you would vote on the merger. Can you, and I know you've touched upon it, that it's not always all about the money, but it seems like that's a pretty important factor in deciding on how you would vote. Could you just explain that a little bit further to me and the whole sequence of things? Sure. Um... To some degree, the sequence is, is goofy because the last time the board made a decision about this, the decision was that we're merging. And then the next thing the board decided was now figure out how we're going to do that. This new thing about whether we're going to merge on or not is an add on. It's not the will of the board not to merge. The will of the board is still to merge until we hear otherwise. That's a little, so that's just a sort of, a, that's to acknowledge that this process is awkward. This week, Tim and I are putting together um, an agenda and an outline for a discussion, which will take a closer look at the numbers. This report that came out in March actually does have, it has cost information. It doesn't have savings information in it. Um, so I did resurrect some savings information from about a little over a year ago. And the savings a year ago for this move was predicted to be about $700,000 a year. That's almost 10 teachers a year um, in that we, so if we can cut $700,000 out of the budget, that's like not having to cut 10 teachers out of the budget. Does that kind of make sense? Because we can save all that money without cutting programs to our kids. Um, but there will be costs associated with a building expansion. And I think what you'll see um, in our, it'll come out in our leadership packet this week, which comes out on Friday. Um, and I, I actually strongly advise you to just always take a look, not just at our agenda, but this report that Tim and I put out um, before every meeting, because it really gives you uh, a sense of sort of the between the lines of the agenda. You know, you guys as select board members, you of course know how to read your own agenda and, and understand what's really gonna happen at the meeting. But probably some of your community members haven't kind of learned exactly what that implies. So Tim and I make this report to try to be really clear about what's going to happen and, and what the, what it's going to be like. So this week, I really do hope to let people dig into um, seeing the, the savings opportunities, um, which this is all very rough, right? We're not, these are not, <laughs> these are just rough to give you a sense of the scale um, and to and to look at the, uh, the costs, depending on if we do temporary, if we do permanent, 
you know, I even, I, I'm pretty sure I've got to run my models by the finance director before they go, they get publicized. But I think I've been able to create a model that shows, okay, if we pay for the temporary one for three years, and at the same time we start paying on the bond, this is what it's going to cost every year. So I think you're, I think that might be the kind of information you're talking about, right? Does that sound right? And no, so we'll right. have a chance to dig into that this week, or it'll actually be, sorry, on the 12th, before we have this meeting on the, um, on the 28th. And we had provided some sort of big numbers, but it, I think it was hard to read it in a kind of intuitive sense and really be able to see how it all comes together. So we're getting there. Okay, well, but thank you. That's a very good answer. Thank you very much. Yeah. So Tori, is, um, do you mind sending maybe Sasha, um, when you send out your agenda, send her the agenda in your, your little piece so we could, is that something you sure, could do? Sure. Maybe I could ask Sasha, what do you get from us typically? Because it's in the board packet every month. So if you get that, it is in that. Is it in that? Yes, I believe, I believe Sherilyn gets it as the class. So maybe Sherilyn can forward to you. So basically what happens is the front page of the packet is the, um, is the agenda. And then hopefully every month, every the month. next page or two are the leadership report. And that also always includes links to, you know, say we're having a discussion about the middle school. So like in our last week's report, we sort of said, this is what we're going to talk about. Um, and by the way, here are links to the relevant um, materials. And so it's, it's a pretty easy way to get caught up to um, the materials that we're using, the resources that we're using, and get a sense of how the discussion is going to be framed. Not what people are going to say, but how it will be framed. Sure. Now, that would be good. And Sherilyn, in the future, yeah, maybe you could pass that to Sasha, and she could send it out to the board. Does that, and does that sound like what you're receiving, Sherilyn? The packet. I, um, I do not recall receiving any packets. I, I know where we get the agendas, but I have oh, not. Oh, so you just get a one page thing. Okay. Um, I'm happy to ask Shannon to, uh, or Shannon and Laura to add you guys to that list. I don't, I don't see any problem with um, that. If they can add you to the, the distribution can, list. That, was, that sounds good. I, I like the idea of um, your explanation kind of between the lines. Yeah, I don't want to do it, but right. I think, it's, <laughs> I think some weeks it takes us ten to fifteen hours, or maybe maybe not fifteen, but it it can be a huge investment of time. But boy, these our meetings lately are so full that it feels like if we don't lay that groundwork, it's very hard to feel like we're really doing a thoughtful job with what we're considering. Yeah, with that many board members, it's it's difficult to let everyone have their time if really without that type of stuff. Thanks, John. Did you have any um, questions or or Callie? Yeah, I, um, I, I do. Uh, hi, Tori and Tim. Good seeing you both again. And um, I was just wondering, uh, the other night at the board meeting, um, you were talking about uh, whether to add uh, two, four, six, and whether they'd be permanent or annex and so on. And I'm just wondering, are you considering the, uh, the pandemic and the fact that there are just so many unknowns going forward uh, who knows in the future? Uh, I mean, the governor's done such a great job in Vermont. Who knows in the future? It it might be a recommendation that class sizes be a lot smaller than they are now. Uh, you know, with social distancing and everything else. You know, we just don't know what's going on. Um, so, I just am curious if that's come into play at all in, in terms of your discussions. Tim. It I've been dominating. Would you like to take this one or would you like me to just keep going? You know, you're on a roll. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Social distancing and the future of the district. Um, this is a, this is an unknown. Um, I will tell you that I personally have a fear that this is our first pandemic and not our last. Um, but I also feel like I can't go through life planning on living pandemic after pandemic after pandemic, right? Like, how could we, how could we do that? If it turns out that social distancing becomes something that we have to plan around all the time, it does seem like districts all across Vermont will have to rethink a lot of things. And, and also what I have seen this year and last year is that when the districts were expected to pivot <laughs> and pivot and pivot, 
um, and to hire new staff in order to provide a different level of service or a different style of service to deal with the pandemic. The state has provided money for us to do that. So John, I think it's fair to expect that if indeed <laughs> we continue to live in this semi-apocalyptic moment, um, that we will have to be needing funding um, from the state to do that. The other thing actually is that, for instance, right now, we are able to do three foot spacing with masks um, in our schools. You know, it, it is working. And the spread in our schools has been almost nil. So the other thing we've learned is that these protocols really work. They have been a lot of work. You know, it has been a huge amount of effort for our students, for our teachers, and of course, for our custodial staff to um, develop all new protocols. But the kids have done a great job. The teachers have done a great job. And we have seen almost no spread in our schools. A lot of the spread has occurred outside the schools and then been brought to the schools. Um, but there's, there's almost no evidence that the, school, the spreading is happening inside the buildings. Um, and and the, the K to six kiddos have been at this three foot spacing for, uh, or three, three to six foot spacing for um, most of the year. And it's just the seven to 12 who've just gone to it uh, last week. Uh, so actually one other thing to think about is, you know, we'll have, we'll have more research or we'll have more data by the end of the year. Um, and, and all of these decisions and the implementation of these decisions is, is more than a year out, right? So again, we'll have another year to collect data and see, does it feel like we're gonna need social distancing? Right now, the word that we're getting is we're not likely to need more social distancing next year than what we're doing. There, I have heard that there's a possibility we'll need masking and we'll maybe need to continue some other protocols, but I think we'll have a better sense of where we are you know, in August. But we still have a whole year after that. Do you feel like I've done a halfway decent job answering you? You, uh, you got me to have to pretend I was Dr. Fauci or Dr. Levine there, so hopefully I did. Okay. Sounded good, Tori. Anyways, um, thank you. Yeah, Kelly, did you have anything for the two? I don't. You actually did a great job, really explaining or answering any questions that I had, and I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come in and have this conversation tonight because I think it's been helpful at least for me thanks you know we're glad to be here i i strongly feel that um few of all people know about how complicated stuff is and how many um interests and i don't mean like political interests i mean like the needs of the different groups that you're trying to meet anytime you're making a decision um and we definitely see that and so i think we're glad to sort of we're share some of that perspective and context that we're working in Tim, I bet you've got some thoughts to add here. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, again, you, you close well there, you know, to John's question. You know, I think the chess match that everyone has watched uh, play out uh, this year uh, has been just definitely handled by, you know, our administrators and, and all uh, that support all sports staff that, that have kept our schools open. I'm so very thankful and horrified to look around the nation and see people that are so far behind us still. So, uh, you know, I agree that uh, normal uh, may take on a new tone uh, this fall, but hopefully that means uh, all of our children are in school and, and I think our children will be prepared and as will our uh, administration, our teachers, our support staff will be prepared to, to meet those uh, challenges going forward. But I think we have come to that moment where now our schools are open um, and you sort of get that, you know, it, it couldn't be any uh, more constrictive than it is. And, uh, and we're making, you know, making it work. And the schools are yeah, actually the... vibrant, joyful places too. That's been, I've been actually subbing because they were so desperate for subs that they even let the board members do it. Uh, <laughs> but it has been, oh, well, it's been a lot of work and it's been, I've had a lot of moments to relearn humility and practice humility. But um, boy, being around that kind of, student energy and seeing the warmth and the connection and the joy and the play that is still happening in our schools has been a bright spot uh, in, in challenging times. Yeah. Now that, that's great. The administration has done a great job and the teachers, um, everyone within the school, um, you know, and it's noticeable, I mean, you know, from the outside. So uh, that's great. And uh, thank you both for, for coming in.
communication, um, as, as, as Kelly said, is uh, beneficial. And I think uh, open communications with all of us um, work best. So again, again, thanks. And if there's anything ever you guys uh, want from us or questions, this board certainly uh, reach out anytime. Great. Well, thank you all. It's good to be here with you. All right, thanks. And um, so yeah, we'll go ahead and move on the agenda and uh, thank everyone for having patience. I know we kind of gone over, but I thought it was important, uh, good discussion, so it was worth it to go. So uh, it sounds like, or looks like Cheryl Lynn may have um, audio and video, uh, now. Um, unmute yourself now so we can hear you. I did unmute it, can you hear me? I can now, Cheryl Lynn. Okay. So now we have Cheryl Lynn um, here to talk about uh, some financial stuff. So go ahead, Cheryl Lynn. Okay, um, I sent um, all the board members the loan for the sidewalk um, that was approved, um, and I'm going to need at least three board member signatures. So if you could, three of you or all of you, sign that and scan it back to me uh, by 9 tomorrow morning, that would be appreciated so I could get it back to the bank. That being said, and with there, there's also the resolution that's part of the loan as well that needs to be adopted. Um, and there's also a validation resolution, which is something that we normally don't have to do. Um, that's due to um, the fact that it's over a five-year term. Um, it's a 10-year term loan. So in order for that to this loan to go through, the validation resolution needs to be signed off on stating that um, we've done everything that we're supposed to do. Um, we warned the article in the warning um, for town meeting one time and anything that is over five years needs to be warned at least three times in the paper, which is why the validation resolution needs to be signed off on. Um, it's gone to the attorneys, our town attorneys, the bank attorneys, um, and this is just the next step for us to uh, move forward with this loan. Very good. Did everyone have an opportunity to um, see that it was sent today? So if you put it uh, sometime this evening, print that out um, and go ahead. Again, this is something that was approved. This is a 10-year uh, loan, so there'll be 10 payments at $26,884.35. Uh, for nine of them, the other one, the last one's um, 40 cents plus accrued interest. Um, so something we all uh, that was voted on, but just go ahead and uh, sign that if you could and scan it over back to Sherilyn. And with the resolutions as well, uh, and the, the um, uh, she has in this packet, you'll notice all, any of the things that we need to adhere to. Uh, for the certification is, is in there. So go ahead and uh, read that if you have any questions on whether it's being done or not. Uh, and sure. with that being said, Tom, I'm gonna need someone to make a motion to adopt um, the resolution and the validation resolution as well. All right. I'd move uh, said um, uh, motion. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Kelly. John, thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing and hearing none, all in favor of the motion vote aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. All right. Anything else, Sherilyn? Yeah, I, got, I have two more things that I need to go over. Um, another article, Article 11 for the um, self contained breathing apparatuses. Um, we need to look at funding for that. Um, Stefan had given you guys the bids that you opened and the voters approved 22,000. The bid came in at 21,999. I went out to three other banks and they all put bids back in with, I asked for a three year and a five year term. And the lowest rate that I got for a three year term would be 1.59. The five-year term is a 1.89. Um, that would be through community bank as well. Um, no one else could beat those rates at all. Um, I just want to point out there that um, it was discussed with Stefan that he was looking at possibly going back to the voters um, again next year for another three self-contained breathing apparatuses. So. 
I just want to remind you of the terms of the three and five year loans on there. Um, I did speak with one other member on the finance committee and they were thinking about the same thing because if that's the case, then either we get to either come up with the money or put it into the budget next year. Um, so that being said, um, I would recommend- well, on that, that, well, we also have, um, we can just add this into the tax rate this year when we do the tax rate in um, June, right? Do you mean the, the 21,000? Yeah. No, you have to, no, you can't. You have to put it into the budget in order to put it into the tax rate. All right. Um, all right. So um, are you wanting us to make a decision on that 21, on that tonight? I would because I believe um, Sasha may have a better answer, but I do believe that these have been ordered. Um, so we're going to have to have the financing for them. Set up. I, um, I just had not had enough. So it's three or five years. Right, three years at one point five nine, a payment of seventy five sixty seven, or five years at one point eight nine with a payment of forty six fifty two. And so you and the other person on the finance committee, what was their recommendation? Uh, recommended going to three years, just in case you guys decide not to put it in the budget and we have to finance again next year. Um, again, these loans can be paid off early um, without penalties. Yeah. Um, I would recommend next year, if you guys want to do this, maybe you just put it into the budget and then we don't have to worry about a payment, but we can discuss that in November. Very good. Um, John, what do you think? Or Callie, thoughts? It's my thoughts to go ahead with what the um, finance committee says. But I would take any other thoughts. No, I, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. good. Callie, think so? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to move to go ahead with the three year. Uh, note for the scuba equipment. Um, there second. a second. I'll Callie, thank you. Callie's in there. Um, any further discussion? All right. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Here you go, Sherilyn. Um, and the next is the town hall uh, windows. Um, we are we had discussed, we did get a grant for that. Um, the the um, bid came back higher than the original bid due to the fact of their price changes. Um, that being said, uh, the total that the project is gonna cost is $5,350 more than planned on. Um, we, put $3,550 in the budget. The total job now is gonna cost $12,450. Um, I'd also li I'd like to point out that we did put in building maintenance $5,500. $600 of that is already spoken for because of contracts with the elevator and the fire extinguishers and all. I went back today and looked back on the expenses in the previous year and assuming that nothing major happened with like the foundation or anything um, and expenses go other than that foundation project, we should only go over budget by about $600 if we do move forward. Um, the preservation trust company has to approve anyone who does any of this work in this company that um, put a bid in on it is the one that they did approve. So we can't just go out and have just anyone do this job. Um, Arcadia, the, the, the quote that I sent you is the one that needs to do the job. So I'd like to ask the board to move forward with this project before pricing goes up anymore. So Sherilyn, and the job that's being considered is um, redoing all the windows. Is that correct? Is that? 
Yes, that's correct. Um, they're going to win out. Yeah, they're going to restore them. Um, the weather stripping is going to be done. Um, the springs and all that are going to be done. It's going to hopefully help save on the heat, heating on the building. So when we go in there um, and try to open a window, I'm going to be able to do it without breaking a back or a window or, or something? All right. Um, any questions on Sherilyn's ask? I have a question. Um, and I'm in favor of the project. I'm, I'm just wondering uh, about uh, the bid process because I didn't see where we had a formal bid opening for the project, which I thought, according to our our purchasing policy, we're supposed to have a bid opening process. With, with this grant, I had to put it out to three companies and then they had to put it back to the preservation company or pres excuse me, preservation trust. And then they have to approve who's going to do the work. So okay. you had sort of clarify, you did have three bids. The bids went to preservation trust. They opened them, they made the decision and awarded the bid to, um, you know, whatever the company is and so is that the process? Yeah, I send them all to them. They're already open, but they all get sent to them to approve who's going to do it. And honestly, there was only two companies that responded back. And uh -huh. this is the only company that was going to be able to do the work, one, because of the work that needs to be done. And one company didn't want to have anything to do with it. Sure. Well, I, no, I think Ray had good questions. We asked... We just had that um, purchasing order in another area, so we just want to make sure it's consistent along. As long as you did um, everything as as, uh, as it was supposed to in this going to the historical society or whatever it went to, I think uh, qualifies there. Ray, are you satisfied with that? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, John. What about yourself? Any questions on the projects? No. So Sherilyn, and, uh, and I'll get to you, Callie, I just thought of something as I was, um, so Sherilyn, you said we had, and I don't have my book in front of me, what did we put in, 6,500 for maintenance? We put in 5,500 for building maintenance and for this um, grant, because it was supposed to be a matching grant, was 3,550. Yeah. 3,500. So we're going to get another 3550 from the Preservation Trust when the work is done. The total project is 12450 Right. So you're looking for us to come up with around uh, the difference between 9000 and so 3500 roughly? No, it's going to end up being $5,350 more than what we, the original quote was. Okay. I thought you were getting, you were using, I was wondering how much money are we using out of the 5,500 that we already have? All of it. Well, $5,350 is what would be needed. Out of that $5,500 that's put in the building maintenance, 5,350 would have to be used. And we've already used what, 600 of it? Um, we will have us by the end of the, we've only used 271, but one of the um, inspections hasn't happened yet. All right, well, we, we'll end up, I mean, there's gonna be more maintenance on that building between now and the end of the year. Um, but, you know, we can deal with that as it comes along. Callie, did you have any questions on the, uh, the restoration? No, I think it's a great idea. So. All right, Sherilyn, I don't think you need them because um, that money is in the budget, so you can go ahead. Uh, the board is uh, um, in favor of using that towards towards that grant or towards that window project. Okay, so I, I can go ahead and let Arcadia know that they can move forward. And, and that project will be starting in, in the fall sometime. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Sherilyn. What else? Anything else? Uh, no, that's 
that's all I have for financing. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions for Sherilyn while she's here? All right. So we're going to move ahead. Uh, we have Clark Abenon there in the center square, or at least in my center square. Um, uh, Clark, thank you for your patience. I know we were expecting 6.30 and uh, 6.50, and you can be out on the river right now casting flies around. Um, so why don't you share with us what you have for housing needs on the Housing Needs Committee? Yeah, um, thanks for having me. Sort of seems like old times, so I'm not not surprised or annoyed. It's just very <laughs> early, so. nice to see Santa Claus is still joining us too there, John. Yes. So you're looking good, looking good. And Walter um, hears your voice as well, Clark. And uh, I know Walter. Gee whiz, good to see you there, big guy. Poked up. Hey, um, so I'll try to keep this um, fairly brief. Um, of you know, when um, we were working on the grant for the town office, uh, I was required to go to a housing training and the town was required to have a, um, a housing committee that was um, formed and it didn't really go much beyond that as, as we all know, it never really, um, there's no active projects or uh, any kind of uh, exploration of that going on. However, I felt that it was important to bring it up again, uh, probably because of the focus that's been going on everywhere, particularly in Vermont and in our communities around affordable housing. And um, we have, um, and, and I think I'm, I'll just kind of let you know what I, basically two things that I have in mind. I, what I'd like to try to do in Moortown is take time uh, to focus on how more town can participate uh, in the affordable housing effort. And it's obviously going to be involving some volunteers within the town to take, um, take that on. And I'm not advocating for a particular approach to that at this point, but I did want to bring it up to the select board that I think it's important to take a look at that. Um, I will admit that I've had a fantasy as I take a look at some of the property that are um, that have kind of open spaces within the town as possible places for affordable housing projects. And actually, I was when uh, when Craig was on earlier, and you know, I was reminded about the Living Tree Alliance, and I took a look at the website that they have, and certainly that you know is a also a way that towns and, um, can leverage the space that they have for affordable housing, even though I don't think that's necessarily what Living Tree is designed to do or purports to do, but nevertheless, um, it's an opportunity for um, a group of individuals and families to live in a particular spot um, and keep land open and available, but at the same time create a, you know, a sense of community uh, amongst themselves and also contribute to the life of the town. The other, um, uh, the, the other issue that I think is related to affordable housing in Moortown is also the possibility of exploring um, some wastewater solutions um, in Moortown. Now, I'm not trying to point out any particular problem that I think we have right now. There's no um, obvious um, pollution into uh, rivers or streams or other properties within, within Moortown. However, wastewater solutions have been used in some of the smaller villages, uh, Rochester um, and Warren certainly is an example of that in the Valley. Um, um, and Wolcott is also taking a look at this, um, the possibility of bringing in some kind of decentralized wastewater treatment facility in a particular place in town, perhaps the village, perhaps uh, the junction of 100B and two, um, but uh, this would create an opportunity to, um, for residents to participate if they felt that they wanted to do so and they felt that it was affordable for them. But it could also be something that could provide some economic incentives for business to, to locate in, um, parts of Moortown, given 
the opportunity to have wastewater systems that were um, robust enough to handle different types of um, treatment, you know, whether, you know, if it be a, uh, some sort of commercial kitchen of some sort. Um, we all know that Moortown School cannot uh, produce its own meals because it doesn't have enough adequate wastewater treatment facilities in order to handle that. And if that's, if I'm mistaken at that point and that's changed, let me know, but at least that was my understanding in the past. So um, what I'd like to just um, have people respond to at this point is if you have a perspective of um, others in the, in, in the town that have an interest in doing this that you think that I could reach out to, that would be great. And you don't necessarily have to throw them under the bus right now, but you could <laughs> email me and let me know who those might be. Um, and I would happy to move forward on that. Um, and also if you know as a select board that there are some initiatives that are um, being explored within Moortown. Um, when I think, and I guess the last thing I'll say is my, my definition of affordable housing it, um, or exit, I will kind of put out what my definition of affordable housing is because I'm not sure that I have enough expertise in that to, to offer a definition, but I certainly um, would imagine that if we could provide and develop some affordable housing in Moortown to help meet the demand, um, not only within our town, but also in the region, um, that it would be a place um, that may have um, sort of mixed housing. Um, it may be traditional looking um, um, sort of apartment styles. It may be um, uh, manufactured homes. You know, it could be a variety of things that we might be able to provide in Moortown. Uh, so I'm curious at this point what, you know, any particular um, uh, perspectives that the board happens to have or some things that you would like me to take a look at, which um, I'm, I'm happy to do and, and report back at a, uh, at a later date. Well, thanks, Clark. Um, that was a nice uh, explanation of a committee that we don't often hear from or really think about. Or ever uh, hear from. <laughs> or never hear from. Well, to throw one person under the bus, and I'm going to do that right now, is, is Ray. Um, he did have some interest at one point uh, of, uh, of treatment facilities and such. So you may want to, you two may want to get together. Um, I think anything that you can uh, learn that's going out there, Clark, with affordable housing, um, there's going to be a, a fair amount of money available and whether any of that's uh, earmarked for affordable housing or not, I don't know. Um, so there may be opportunity, money opportunities coming up. Um, but if you were, you know, now that you're retired, have a little opportunity to spend just kind of, you know, what's happening in some of these other communities as far as affordable housing, how are they doing it? Um, because I think it can uh, certainly enrich the community in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a few documents that are online with uh, um, with the state, which I can uh, yeah, I won't yeah, send I won't them send to you because there's you there's they're pretty long and involved. But I'll, I'll take a look at uh, them and and perhaps get on in a month or so and provide you with a sort of a book report of sorts in terms of what those are. Um, and I mean, I will actually <laughs> mention another person in Moortown, um, and I think Ray, you and I may have chatted about this in the past, but um, Karen, Karen Horn was pretty well in, in um, the, the one document that I'm looking at now, um, Karen's actually mentioned in the acknowledgements, it's called Wastewater Solutions for Vermont Communities. Um, so she's certainly um, aware of this and, and probably has a lot more perspective in terms of who's done it and you know, what the outcomes have been. So I'm happy to reach out to Karen too and check in with her. Uh, Tom, can I make a comment? This is David. Uh, yeah. Uh, who, who, I'm um, sorry, who's that? This is David Speck. Oh, David, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Clark, the Planning Commission right now is starting their, their assessment on redoing the zoning in the town, the whole, the whole thing. And I know that affordable housing issue concerns are on their list of things to consider, different ways to 
encourage additional development in town so they meet actually this wednesday i would suggest if you could attend that zoom meeting that would get you in touch with the town committee who is in charge of the zoning and that would be a a good place to to get additional support and karen horn is on the planning commission too right right uh, david what time's the meeting uh 6 30 i believe 6 30 okay it's uh it's on the uh, agenda on the town website with the, the link it is okay and okay great so yeah i'll uh i'll see if i can make that that's that's great thanks thanks david um ray or john did you have any other or uh tally anything for clark yeah i just uh again uh, i've been wanting to get into this village sewer uh because i think it is uh, definitely going to have to happen at some point within the next <laughs> years so i i think uh, uh i would like to be involved with it and clark and and, and start working towards uh, that goal of uh, getting something for this town. Mm -hmm. So okay. I meant to do it last year, but the whole COVID thing kind of put everything back a year. So mm -hmm. looks like we're headed out of it. And uh, I'll reach out to you, you know, sometime towards the end of the month. And yeah. we'll start, okay. start working towards it. Great. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> when I was taking a look at what other towns may be working on this at this point, um, there was a kickoff <clears throat> meeting or one of the meetings in Wolcott to try to explain this process or these solutions um, that was actually held in um, the middle of November in 2019. And there hasn't been anything else on their town website since that. So I think th they also sort of came to a halt um, and maybe some other towns did too. But as we all know, there will be some um, uh, significant monies that'll be coming in and, and, per and perhaps so that will, uh, if you'll pardon the expression, trickle into um, um, into this particular funding stream too. So, um, yeah, I think this is probably a good time to start focusing on this in in more town. Thank you, Clark. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Nice to see you. All right. So we'll, uh, Ray will be in touch with you, and you can uh, move forward. John, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to mention it was uh, good uh, to see Lisa Shepard's project on Route 2. So it'd be good to have yeah, more, so, more like Oh, you mean the the um, um, the, the, the housing project that's right? Yeah. The big yeah. one right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, Gallagher Acres, right? Is that the one you mean? No, not Gallagher Acres. Uh, next to the, the Shepard Homestead there. Blanche Shepherd's house next there. I think it's Riverwalk Hotel. Drive. What's that? Oh, okay. Right. I think it's Riverwalk Drive. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, right. yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. I think that what's been going on in that part of town is, um, and, and it, it, I sense is because of the convenience of being closer to the highway in Waterbury, you know, sort of a village, you know, a village center with services that that, that will continue. Um, so, you know, it, um, Paige, can I ask you a question? Um, just, yeah, I don't, absolutely. I don't, yeah. So, um, uh, now this is, you can answer carefully if you want, but I'm sort of curious in terms of moving into, you know, this, you know, kind of a co-housing or not kind of it's co-housing project, um, is affordability part of the, the, impetus when people think about moving into something like that? Definitely. And it's something our community cares about too. Um, uh, I think it's, I mean, so my, my husband and I are um, moving on a, a prefabricated house, which really cuts down our costs and it's very, very small. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, and then the community was really like open to that um, because they want, you know, uh, there to be, uh, affordable housing options. You know, the cost of our plot was still, you know, for us a significant financial investment. I, I like, I don't know that I'd call it quite affordable housing, but certainly much more affordable for us to be able to live in this kind of like beautiful acreage and to share resources with other families. And there are a lot of reasons that we chose uh, living living tree, but it's definitely something the community is has talked about in our um, common house that we're building. There will be some 
some bedrooms in there and we've talked about ways that maybe we could rent those out inexpensively for people who mm -hmm. want to be part of the community um, but have more limited resources mm -hmm. as, as well. Um, so I would say it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's still tricky to do anytime I think you're, you're building or bringing anything and, and you're mm -hmm. purchasing the land, it's still, you know, like, um, and I mean, some, somewhat of an expense, but definitely way more affordable for us than like, we had looked really briefly at buying land and, and building and that just, you know, wasn't really feasible for, for mm -hmm. us. So it is, it is a topic of discussion, even though, um, I, I wouldn't say that that was why Living Tree started necessarily, or that's not my understanding. Yeah, that's I, that, that, they care about. that was my understanding too. That was that wasn't the um, uh, the overriding, you know, one of the overriding uh, values. That, um, but it seems to be um, a characteristic that is, you know, um, relatively. Um, it's it would I would imagine somewhat common in terms of co housing developments and stuff. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this co-housing development, because we, we actually looked at con uh, communities all over the country, and, and this is way more affordable than, than a lot of them, especially the ones in the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. where like the mm -hmm. starting prices of a lot of the homes in this community are over half a million dollars, like mm -hmm. completely unaccessible for, for most people, I, I think. So mm -hmm. um, from the research we've done, I think that the Living Tree folks, the community we're now a part of, like do care and like want like have that as a, have have that as a goal as well mm -hmm. yeah right and i would echo what you heard from the rest of or a lot of folks when you when craig was on earlier that uh, welcome to moortown we're glad you're here um Thank you're you certainly much. the right age age demographic that we're <laughs> looking for so plan that you'll stay a long time um, <laughs> that's the plan we we're we're having a baby in a few weeks so um that'll probably tie us here as well there you go. Another person in the school, too. So yeah. Yeah. A few so, years. Uh, the school discussion was relevant. I was excited to. Indeed. Start. I could hear, see you watching them. Um, <laughs> so anyway, folks. Um, yeah. Ray, let's talk. Um, I'll plan to get uh, David. Thanks a lot for reminding me about the Planning Commission. Um, I'm, I'm sure John Siegel will be shocked and amazed to see another person joining the meeting. So um, I'll have to be happy to be there. So well, I'll sorry, sign he's... off. And, Thank you very much. It was, um, yeah, you're welcome. Brought me, brought me back to the days of you being on the board. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So now we have um, we have yeah, David. So long, boy. David, uh, thank you for your patience. Um, and I guess Paige, you too, because you were waiting on the the um, E1 E991 discussion, I think. So, David, if you want to come off mute, um, you kind of share what you got going on with us tonight. Okay, the first uh, issue I'll address is the um, Living Tree Lane, Living Tree Community Road name, uh, so that Paige doesn't have to stay here for all night. All right. Okay, so um, this is a, a PUD. All the lot locations are predefined. The driveway, which they're putting in now, that will service two houses in the back, uh, is now also becoming the emergency access to a house which is in front of him, which means that there will be three houses served by that driveway for emergency vehicle purposes. And that triggers a private road name requirement or a road name requirement. Uh, according to the state E91 uh, regulations. The house that's in the front had been assigned an address on Living Tree Lane, but as I said, their access changed from Living Tree Lane to this new driveway. So that address will have to change. And I've been in contact with that owner uh, through Craig and she is amenable to having the address changed um, to accommodate the E91 requirements. So the select board has the ultimate authority to pick the road name. What is customary in this case is the E91 coordinator asks the people affected for their preference. And if that preference is acceptable to the select board, it just 
helps cut down the pain of an address change. So the members of the, the community, I guess went through quite a process and they came up with three names that they would like to have considered. Their third choice is Hemlock Way. Their second choice is Community Lane. And their number one choice is Birdsong Way. I have done research on the name Birdsong Way. There is not another Birdsong Way in the state. So there's essentially no chance of any confusion. So it should be accepted by the Uniting Board. And I would recommend that the Select Board adopts Birdsong Way as the name for the new private road per the residents' wishes. All right, uh, so moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Kelly. Any further discussion? All in favor, vote aye. 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 All right, so it is Birdsong Way. Very nice name. Very good name. Excellent. Okay, the next uh, issue is a address change in the Gallagher Acres development that the state E91 folks are telling me should be made because the current numbering is not accurate, is confusing and is in violation of E91 standards. I forwarded the email that I got from the state that shows the four properties in question. Did everybody get a chance to look at those? Yes. Okay. So this will mean changing the address for four people. And before I went and wrote the letters and assigned new numbers, uh, A, there also should be a name decision and I did not want to proceed with this until I was sure that the select board would approve the change. I don't want another issue as happened with the Barnes application where I assigned a number based on the E9 requirements and the board overrode me and asked me, directed me to change it back. Have you had any discussions with um, the people out there at all, David? No, I didn't Didn't want to rile them up if you were going to say, no, don't do it. Well, I guess, um, I mean, I like to follow what 911 has to say, but um, I guess I haven't been out there and I haven't, you know, and again, I, I did see your letter tonight. I guess I got it. Um, so I don't know um, how I feel on that without at least checking with the residents or seeing what kind of uproar there is going to be uh, with changing someone's address. Um, what's everyone else think? Uh, David, do they give you a, like a uh, time frame? Like, okay, we need it done by uh, the 1st of June or anything like that. Is there no. any time? No. This is actually festered for a while. Yeah, this is stuff that looked like when I read it, uh, that JB had been tossing around at one point. So and, and I don't think another these month things or so. are These things are not fun. So that's why I'm yeah. getting the ducks lined up to make sure if I proceed with this address change, we're all in sync and it's going to carry through. And then the question would be for selecting the name, how much do you want me to be involved trying to coordinate these four people to select a road name. I can just do it in a letter or get interactive, which is gonna take more of my time. So I'd like a little direction on what you think I should expend as effort to try to make them happy. Well, I don't think you need to babysit these people and uh, you know help them make their name. I think in a letter, um, you know, if it's for responsible people, they should be able to come up with a name in a, you know, give them a, you know, a reasonable time period to do that. Um, but I don't think you have to hold their hand right through it, no? That's fine. I can try to do that. No matter how polite you are in a letter, sometimes they're not well received. 
Yeah, you know, sometimes you follow up with a call or you even call beforehand and say, look, I'm going to send you a letter. It's going to be talking about so they so they understand it because you know oftentimes you, you get a letter from the town and all of a sudden you're like oh you, you know there becomes this um certain amount of panic and you don't really read everything that's there so you know either a follow-up call or even a, a call prior to say look at we're, we're doing this and then with the communication behind that with the letters the reason we're doing it is for your safety or for the protection of the people there um and then it typically will have a better outcome so um, depending on how you, you, know, you deliver that message, if you go in and you just say, you know what, I'm changing your address, you know, you're going to get some significant pushback. But if you use, um, you know, a good reasoning why you need to do it, and um, it may not be that painful, but I can see where it'd be somewhat painful regardless. Can I uh, add... Uh, <clears throat> When, these, when the letter goes out, perhaps the uh, the select board, have it be a joint letter with the select board and the zoning administrator and possibly suggest to them that, um, invite them to a meeting in the first meeting in June and, and discuss it with them. So it, you know, kind of eases the, the transition or something like that. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, so do you want me to invite them to the, indicate that this name change is going to happen and invite them to the select board meeting to discuss it? Is, is that what you're... I think we should tell them that we've been directed to do this and, but, you know, if they have some concerns that they want to bring to the town, we should let them come to the select board and address them with us. Yeah, I think we certainly are welcome to, if they have, David, if you get significant pushback, maybe invite them, but I don't think we need to um, open up that door, where, I don't know, where, you know, I don't mind having them at the, the meeting, but uh, if David does a, a good job explaining the letter, why we're doing it, follow up with a call to him, and then if there's significant pushback, and then we can certainly have them come to the meeting at that point. Yeah, I'd honestly, uh, I'm okay with that, Tom. As long as they have the uh, ones that clear them that they, if they have some, that they can come to the select board and, and address their concerns. Yeah, I think so, David. In the letter, just include, you know, at at some point in the letter, if there's significant um, interest to, to talk about this or, or however you want to put that, um, you know, the select board is is certainly willing and able to do that along with you. Okay. Excuse me, I had a cough, so I muted. Oh, uh, that's all right. All right, so I will, uh, I will identify those people and get the letter out to them. Very good. What else you got for us? Uh, we're at 15 zoning permits at this point this year. That's almost exactly what we were last time this year. Uh, I've been approached by Green Mountain Power, who is looking to give away, essentially give away, I don't want to put a price tag on it, but the old schoolhouse on uh, Route 100B up by the middle side. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> They're uh, realizing it's of no value to them. And uh, rather than let it fall apart, they're looking as uh, an opportunity to transfer it to the town, to the historical society. <clears throat> In my last contact, uh, they had not received any contact from the historical society. Uh, so I don't know if there is interest on the part of the town or the historical society to take over this building, to get this property. So if you could forward that information, um to Sasha, she can send it out to the, the board so we can take a look at that. I haven't, this is the first that I've heard that we were offered the property. Um, and then, uh, you know, if we can discuss as a board that may be other uses. I mean, we were just uh, um, 
talking about affordable housing. I don't know if that's a candidate for something like that, but um, yeah, I think it's something we should certainly take a look at to see um, if it is of any value to us as a zoning administrator and you know, knowing being a little familiar with the property, do you see any value to the town with it? Um, the, the wastewater is going to be a, an issue to determine. <clears throat> and I've been working with uh, Robert Pelosi, the district engineer, to try to determine how much land would have to go this and what the wastewater requirements would be. Um, it depends on a final determination of the status of the building from a uh, wastewater perspective. Uh, he was saying he could probably view it as an abandoned non-functional building, so it's not even considered a structure and doesn't need any wastewater. However, <clears throat> the downside is if the, the town does want to take it over and, and develop it where wastewater is required, then you've got to have the land to do it. And you just have a building with land and nothing can be done with it. So oh, very preliminary still. But I thought okay. you were aware that this is what they're looking at doing. All right, well, certainly make us or uh, keep us uh, appraised of what's going on. And um, I'll, you give know, Sasha, good I'll give Sasha updates and Perfect. appraise the board of them. Thank you. I was wondering, does uh, Don know about this? John? You know, he's, in the past, he did a lot of work on that. Don Wexler. Yeah. Don Wexler. Uh, I don't know. Okay. We can uh, make him aware, certainly. David, uh, would that building be, it must be in the floodplain or floodway or something, isn't it? No. It's not. Okay. No, it's, it's high. It's way high. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, if it gets up there, Ray, there's, it's been a bad day for a lot of people. If it gets that high, there will be no no power station left. Yeah, the power station is up below that. All right, David, anything else for us? Uh, Martin Cameron had... Uh, <clears throat> asked me about a storage unit in the lot where the town, uh, you know, the town gravel yep. pit is. Uh, I had given him some information and then I went to give him, I did give him new information via phone message, but he, uh, I guess he's on medical leave right now. So yeah. that has been delayed. Okay. It's development in the flood hazard area, so it's got to go through all the hoops that we went through on Dickerson Road. And I told him that I would do the applications. And I've learned that since this is a storage structure only and not an occupied structure, <clears throat> it will not need a certificate of elevation, which is going to save $900 in engineering fees but it still has to go through the permit process and it will have to be vented for a flood. By venting, I mean openings of a certain amount, one square inch of vent per square foot of floor space that's in the flood hazard area so that the pressure equalizes the water can go in and out of the building or structure. So it can be done, it's not as expensive, but it's still gotta have the permit and be reviewed by the state and go through the DRB. So do you know when Martin is gonna be back and up to speed? He should be back later uh, this week. He just needs to get a medical letter um, that his knee is back to where it needs to be, which I anticipate him getting. Um, but he'll, so towards the end of this week or beginning of next week, I'm sure he'll be, um, he'll get in touch with you or if you wanna reach out to him again, David, just to, um, let them know you have your stuff. That would be fine. Yeah, I'll, I'll give him a week or so to get reacclimated to work. He's probably got a heck of a backlog. <laughs> yeah, I think so. But the guy's been doing a good job trying to keep that to a minimum, but yes, I'm sure he'd appreciate that. Okay, I will contact him. Anything else? 
I don't think nothing, um, uh, nothing for me at this point. Any of the other members of the board have any questions for David? All right, I guess not, David. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight and thank you for your patience. Appreciate well, it. Again, I have been working with the Planning Commission on suggestions to improve the zoning and they are really acutely aware of the need for additional housing and they're looking at different ways to modify the zoning to accomplish that. Good. Well, I'm sure that there's a lot of brain power around that table. They can, they can come up with something and make it so people are still um, not doing what we should be doing with the environment and building where we shouldn't be, but sounds good. Um, thank you, David. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on uh, to reports and communications. Uh, Sasha, why don't we go ahead and start with you? Do you wanna share what you have for the board tonight? Yep, um, Jerry Cazzles was going to join the meeting. He must have forgot about it. Um, he would, he's interested in using the town hall. Um, he started a driving school for teenagers and would like to know if he could hold classes at the old town hall. There will be 12 students in a class Mondays and Wednesday nights, 5.30 to 8, starting June 3rd through July. And that was in the, um, the basement, is that correct? Yes. yes. And do you know if we have uh, library hours at that time? I do not know. But and again, uh, five thirty. No, that's all right. Um, five thirty to eight. Yes. And Monday and Wednesday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Monday and Wednesday nights. Monday and. And he was looking uh, how much it was going to cost him. Is that what his question is, or if we would allow him to do it? I think both. All right. Uh, what's everyone think? John, Ray, Kelly. Uh, my feeling is if it follows the state guidelines as far as COVID uh, requirements, I don't have a problem with it. Kelly? Yeah, I have a problem with it. Yep, same, same with me. Same with me. It would be nice yeah, to no, get I a feel... little, little bit of income from it, but. Yeah, so what, um... And Sasha, I don't know what what was uh, did he suggest or what he wanted to pay or do we? I can't yeah. remember us. We've done some of these things in the past. Mm -hmm. um, he is in the community. He, uh, I mean, I don't know what. I don't know what do you guys think or. Per um, class and considering it, the place will have to be cleaned um just the downstairs so why don't we do you want to um i don't know what 50 bucks a night does that sound reasonable or too much too little or what do you guys think i really don't have a good handle on the cleaning cost uh, but certainly it, it shouldn't be a town expense so the fee is going to be enough to cover the cleaning plus you know electricity and heating and all that other stuff. So I guess I, 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 it depends on what the cleaning cost would be, would determine, you know, all those factors together would determine the rate, in my opinion. All right, so we, um, I'll work with Cheryl Lynn and try to come up with, with uh, or Sasha, you can, what it might cost to clean the place. And, and again, I, I think it's good that we just have people using it. I'm not looking to make, uh, you know, a big profit here. I just want to, I don't want it as races. I just don't want it to cost me something either. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, you know, so you let them know that. So, yeah, we're willing to let you use it. We're just trying to figure out what it's going to cost us and we'll pass that on to you. Okay. Um, Robbins reached out and he'd like permission to have their meetings outside behind the town office. Who was that that reached out? 
Steve Robbins for the rec. Oh, Steve, yeah. Um, I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Okay. I didn't think you would. Um, I had a call from Dean Moulton today, just wanting an update on his property pins. I can give you an update. Okay. It'll be within two weeks. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Quick and easy to it. Also, um, I know Sherilyn had talked about it before. She got the grant for the plate compactor. Yep. And I just wanted to remind everybody it needs to get ordered soon. Yeah, I talked to Martin the other day and um, did remind him about that. So I think that's when he gets back. One of the, probably the first things he did. I think the other guys were looking into it a little bit, but uh, he is aware of that. Okay. Yeah. So I uh, it's Stefan. I got the I got three different quotes together for the plate compactor. Martin's just got to sit down and see what makes sense. We all talked about it and have you know what makes sense to us. You know, working in the ditches, but we want to run it through Martin and then get it to you guys. Thank you, Stefan. That's all I have. Thank you, Sasha. John, how about you tonight? So I don't forget you like you did last week. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I got a call or an email from uh, Angelo at the uh, Commons Condominium Association um, about a dog issue there. Stefan, uh, is that resolved? Um, it is not. I have to reach out to um, the dog owner and talk to her um, just so you guys are all aware. I, I was home today. I, I have a cold and it's, it's kind of taken me down, but I, I do plan on at least contacting the dog owner tomorrow and trying to figure out what's going on a little better. Okay. I, I guess, I guess uh, there's been an issue with him going after like uh, uh, UPS and um, maybe biting some people or what, I guess he's just been harassing the, uh, the neighbors there. Yes, it, it, uh, it appears to be that there's not, uh, you know, there hasn't actually been any bites. It's just been, you know, snarling teeth and, and you know, harassing because it hasn't been leashed. Okay. All right, John, anything else? No, that's it. All right. All right, Callie, what you have for us? Uh, um, not much. I did talk to Stefan on Sunday about a dog issue. He called me and I called him back. Um, and at that point, he had it pretty well figured out. And um, we also chatted really quick about um, Fountain Forestry had talked to Stefan about some burn sites. They came up to do a site visit up on the Herringbrook side of what they own and had had a conversation with him about some burn sites up there and probably some other concerns I would assume, but just chatted really quick about that. So other than that, that's it. If you'd like, I can, uh, I can go in depth a little bit on that. If you, if you guys want to hear about it. Well, sure. We got a couple minutes stuff on what's going on up there. Um, so I talked to fountain forestry They're uh, they take care of 2,100 acres up there and they did a site visit last week and you know, their, their concern is mostly uh, that, you know, where there's, there's burn spots where they, people have been having fires on their property up there. And the biggest part, you know, that's their income that they could potentially burn down up there. And he asked about options with, you know, checking it out and, you know, writing fines or whatnot for burning up there. And I, also talked to my supervisor for the state fire warden 
and he agreed that it's absolutely you know unacceptable for somebody to burn on a property without permission so i've been um going up there a little bit more to try to assess to see if there's somebody burning up there and i've been getting the word out that i will be up there kind of patrolling and and i will be writing fines just something you know hopefully it helps deter people from doing it but it's a it's something that the town can can do fairly easily to try to help you know make it make the issue go away i think that's good stuff on just um you know be careful when you put yourself in those situations as well just you know mind that too absolutely Stephen, who was it that you met with from um town forestry uh jeff something or rather um Lang 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 yeah. Jeff Long made. I did. I did try to reach out to him. In fact, I left him a message today uh, uh, about the meeting with the uh, Callie and, and myself, as far as uh, uh, generally the road and what's happening up there and what what found forest they would like to to see up there. So uh, okay, I just want to make sure that Jeff was still the the correct contact and sounds like he is so i'm hoping to, to hear back from him within a few days and and we could pursue the other issue of the, of the uh, road damage and, and what's going on up there with him as well absolutely he uh you know he mentioned it to me about the the road damage and the the off trails onto their property that are just getting spun up and and you know eroded away and he said he was, was going to be doing some more work hopefully up there to protect you know the you know put up more barriers and such and more signage and he brought up the idea of posting it all off um you know no trespassing which is something they were thought about a couple of years ago but didn't really want to you know close it all off but you know it's becoming an option for them again he said yeah no i, I and that's what we're trying to avoid uh, you know it's a it's a well-used piece of land by a lot of the local people, and unfortunately, it's being destroyed by the non, a lot of non-local people. <laughs> so, anyways, not to drag on about that, but uh, we are pursuing something with them. Yeah. Thank you, Stefan Ray. Um, sorry, Ray. What about do you uh, just share that? Anything else, Ray, that you have? Uh. I did want to talk about, and I don't know if you want to talk about it right here, but as you know, I, I do uh, sign a lot of invoices from the town uh, garage, and, and there's two that really that struck with me was a, a new fuel tank for the a truck. Uh, I believe that might have been around $4,500, uh, which I don't think was in the budget. And then uh, there was another one today for some suspension work. Uh, I think it was almost two thousand dollars. So I'm I'm just a little concerned about you know, number one signing these invoices. <laughs> you know, I don't even hear about this stuff until the work is already done. You know, nobody says we have this problem. You should be aware of this. It's like okay, we had the problem. Here's the invoice. It, it, I don't. It seems like it should be. Here's the problem. I'm going to get some pricing to fix it. You know, I understand there are sometimes emergencies, but it, it just seems like it's procedure now right. to just spend money and then expect the town to pay for it. And I just would like to see a little bit more communication here. I know I think that's reasonable. Um, and, uh, you know, once Martin gets back, uh, you know, we can have him in the board meeting or maybe sit down with him and and just go over some of those things. I think in the last, you know, year, year and a half, things have gotten away a little bit because of, uh, you know, again, we, I guess we blame everything on COVID now, but um, oftentimes I used to hear when there was a breakdown and, and such and, and that we had things going on. Um, so, yeah, I think we need to address that with the crew and, and Martin and just make sure that we were on the same page um 4500 for a fuel tank yeah i have so no. i can i can explain that a little bit um I, it was a high amount for the fuel tank it was 1500 i don't know where the 4500 came from 
Uh, it was fifteen hundred and thirty seven dollars. Um, and it was actively leaking on the floor of the shop and out at the pump. So as opposed to, you know, having some sort of environmental issue, we immediately brought it before it leaked all out to um, Sheldon's to get fixed. Right, I, think, I think the amount of 4,500 is correct. I know his truck was up um, previous at Sheldon's for um, some brake work because the brakes weren't working properly um but the 4500 should not have it shouldn't have been a thing because i asked um for a price from them before before anything happened and it was fifteen hundred dollars it was, was still high in my eyes but it shouldn't have been 4500 it was a combination of a couple of invoices it wasn't just that Stefan. oh okay i just i i heard the 4500 i'm like that's an awful lot for the fuel tank even <laughs> you know because i i talked to him so i i thought I had an idea of what it was. Okay. Thank okay. you. So yeah, right. When, um, you know, why don't we plan a meeting, you know, sometime next week with Martin and just so that we can make sure that we're uh, seeing these things before they're, they're happening or uh, as Stefan says, some of the leaky gas tank or fuel tank, you know, I guess there's not a lot you can do about it, but, um, Certainly, uh, it wouldn't hurt to have a little heads up with this stuff uh, prior to signing off on it. Yeah, and uh, Stefan, I think it was the right decision to get it fixed. I just, uh, you no, know, and, like and I didn't even think about, you know, this This has happened since uh, Martin's been out. And, you know, the first thought in our eyes was, well, let's get it so we don't end up having to have it towed and, you know, have leaking fuel and, you know, have that all dealt with. Let's get it there, you know, get it so that, you know, it's in their yard and they can take care of it before we have to have a toad and such. Okay. Thank you, Stefan. So Ray, anything else you got there? Nope, I'm good, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I think I'm all set, we did, um, yeah, I guess we can move ahead. Uh, so we have the minutes of um, April 19th to go ahead and approve. I make a motion to approve the April 19th. Thank you, Ray. Second. Sasha, I mean, uh, Callie, thank you. All in favor of the uh, meeting no, minutes? No, no, no. They, we, they need to be amended. <clears throat> hey, John. Sasha, have a do you have a chance to take a look at that? Uh, take yourself off mute. Sorry. Yes, I did see it, and I will make the adjustments on it for the executive session. Okay. All right, so, so with that uh, adjustment made for executive session, was that the only thing, John? Yeah, yeah that, that, uh, that was it, yeah. All right. So, so um, and the motion's out there. All in favor, vote aye. Would be uh, just as amended. As amended. As, as amended. Yeah. I amend. I amend my motion to include as amended. Ray, thank you. Now the new motion, the minutes as amended for April nineteenth. All in favor, vote aye. Aye. Hi. Hi. All right. Very good. Um, so let's go ahead. We got some old business. Did we get the sand bit thing straightened out? Sasha, did you hear anything? Nothing. I haven't heard right. anything. So we'll again. Um, it's really Martin. He's out, so we can't really get back to us on that, anyways. Um, MOU, the other thing, um, there were a few people we were working on, um, was it pricing on the, uh, oh, the, the parking lot out there that we were gonna get to the board, uh, the Harwood Union board, is that something that, I know, uh, I think Ray, you were working on that with Sherilyn and John maybe? Right. Uh 
we did have a meeting last week. Did you want to talk about that now? Or? Uh, we don't have to go into it. I just want to make sure that you guys are, that it's being, that you're, you're, you're working on it, I guess is all I want to make sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ray and I need to uh, touch base in terms of meeting with the neighbors. All right. So when you guys are good, I just want to make sure everyone's moving forward and um, that we're, we're on time with that to them. Uh, that's about it with old business, I think. Um, new business. So I have a couple things. One, I was thinking that um, June 7th, uh, which is the first Monday in June that we're scheduled for a meeting that we would uh, or could um, meet at the town office. Um, we'll be able to at that point be, I guess it's three feet we need now. Um, we can mask to my knowledge, um, and no one needs to tell me or not, but I think we're all vaccinated. Um, is everyone, what's everyone's thoughts on that? I would like very much that for that to happen. John, are you fine comfortable? By yep. yep, fine by me. Kelly, how are you? All right. So um, we will go ahead and do that. If Don um is very much opposed uh, we can do a skype uh for him um and sasha you're all right with uh, attending that as well yeah okay very good so we'll plan that for the the 7th of june getting back to to meeting there um the other new business that we had we may have brought it up a little bit um are we going to do anything for um, more fest this fall. We've got money in the budget. Um, I know, uh, and I, I Lindsay, uh, and I don't know Lindsay's last name, uh, but she's on the school, she was on the school part. She contacted uh, Leanne, my wife, uh, to see if there was anything going on and that she would be willing to, to work on it from the school perspective. Um, so, I mean, there's a little bit of energy there to start with. I just don't know what everyone's thoughts are. I guess my thought is, uh, you know, I think I'd, I'd like to see something. I'm just not, you know, when or what yet. <laughs> but, uh, what are you, what's everybody thinking? And what, what were you thinking, Tom? Well, I think, um, you know, I, I think fireworks seem to be a big draw for people. I was thinking of having a big bonfire, fireworks, have the, the fire department there um, doing the corn roast. Maybe the select board could do a pig roast. Um, and sometime in the early September, just do that and just have everyone come. And if we can get some music, um, as well, that would probably be the other third thing that we need. We got food, we got some music, and um, they would probably do a beer tent, I would imagine, the school part would. Um, but, you know, nothing, I mean, something nice like that, but just an opportunity for, all right, this is what we're having, and everyone can come down and enjoy an evening. Yeah, that's, that's a start. I like the idea. You know, and it's not too commercially where it's, you know, we're having vendors and uh, that type of pressure. It's more people just to come down and see people again, you know. Uh, and uh, so, you know, when the uh, fire department could raise a little money with a, with a corn roast or whatever if they wanted it, if not. But we'd be oh, we, we want to. We were just discussing doing it as well. So, um, yeah, and you could do, you know, and you do the pigs too or whatever. So, you know, just something kind of low key like that. But, you know, anyone could come, but, you know, really focus towards our more town people uh, and just, hey, we're, we're, we've come through this pandemic, hopefully at that point. Um, you know, 
and we can always cancel, but uh, if we don't schedule something, we won't be uh, doing anything. Right. Probably have to get on the firework uh, agenda or schedule pretty quickly, I would guess, right? Yeah, but being an off, you know, maybe not a week, you know, I, um, a holiday type thing, it might be a little easier, but yeah, I think you'd want to get a contract there fairly quick. Um, and also if they were, you know, finding uh, some kind of a band to play or something, but, um, you know, I can mention it to those two people who had uh, expressed interest, they could put something out on front porch form to form some kind of a committee or group to do it and see what they come up with and then report back to us. Sounds good. And so, Copasec with everyone. Yep. All right. Um, I think that's all I had. Um, yeah, I think everything else is stuff. Uh, but yeah, we're all good. I thought it was good tonight um, getting Tori to come. I know we had originally talked about sending a, a letter, but that she was able to come, her and Tony. So I thought that was uh, better. And I think it's good to have the communication there. So, um, you know, hopefully we can keep that open and, you know, be in the, in the loop there with that a little bit. Yeah, no, that, that was really good. I mean, I uh, sat in on the section of their meeting the other night that dealt with the merger. And it was a question and answer for the, for the board members and both Lisa and Kristen had some, some good questions. Um, but, um, you know, there's still, you know, a lot is up in the air. And oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I did. So I did have actually today, it's, just want to make mood, uh, the mood seems. I was just going to say, I heard from uh, Christine Sullivan actually reached out to me today. Uh, from the Harwood board. I didn't speak with her. She left a message. I was in the meeting at the time. Um, so there is a, uh, at least they're reaching out a little bit at this point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is, which is a good sign and, and things seem to be okay. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, we'll, you know, continue to monitor that and we'll offer our input when we can, I guess. All right, so if there's nothing uh, that's tending here, and I don't think there is, we can probably get out of here. I do want to remind everyone, though, to please sign um, both the, the um, financing and the other declaration and get it uh, sent back to Cheryl Lynn if we could make her happy because you know how she gets. <laughs> Will do. All right. <laughs> There's three places that need to be signed on that note. I didn't think you were still on, Sherilyn. Where the hell are you? <laughs> Just so you can't see me. It's getting late. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, so she's here. So anyways, uh, we appreciate that, everybody. And I move to uh, adjourn. Second. All in favor, vote aye. Aye. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'll be in touch, John. Okay.